Hey, what's up, guys? It's Michael from The Honest Youth Pastor with another sermon review. Today, we are going to be looking at Andy Stanley. Uh, it's going to be a part one of a series he started apparently in September. This particular video was uploaded September 20th to North Point Community Church's YouTube channel. You can watch the full sermon uh, through the link in the description below. The reason I wanted to cover Andy Stanley, obviously, he's not um, within the category uh, as far as influence goes of like the other pastors that we've covered on this channel, like Furtick or Judah Smith or, uh, Mike Todd, those sort of guys. Um, but he does have, he keeps coming up. Like I've noticed he keeps coming up in the comment sections of some of the memes. And I do get quite a few more than I would think, uh, uh questions about, uh, about him within the DMS about, you know, his preaching style. Now to be clear and transparent. Um, I have maybe listened to maybe two Andy Stanley sermons. Th this would be number three. So I, I, he's just not somebody that's been on my radar a lot and not somebody that, um, I get sent a lot of sermons on. I'm not sure why uh, I have watched this through one time, but we're going to go through and do the sermon review on Andy Stanley, just like we would do with everybody else and kind of looking at like, again, red flags. What are we looking for? Is this good? Is this bad? Are we, um, you know, are we exegeting the text correctly? All those sorts of things, context, are we looking at those sort of things? Uh, now I think Andy kind of the, the articles I have read, cause he came up on my Twitter feed I'm not sure, like last week. Uh, and it wasn't even him. Somebody had shared an article of an interview that had been done in regards to the election and his response and all of that hoo-ha. Um, and he seems like a fairly reasonable person. I know there are people um, that don't like him. I'm not sure why. Um, I, I don't know enough about him maybe to understand that. I'm sure the one thing I do know about Andy Stanley is that uh, a few years ago, he said we should unhitch the Old Testament from the New Testament. And he got a lot of uh, heat from that. Um, not sure exactly. Once again, like if he was, I've, I've seen a few interviews where he was trying to explain that. Um, anyway, long story short, it's not what we're here for. We're looking at this sermon in particular to see, you know, how his preaching style is, what he does with the text. Um, so that's what we're looking at. So let's get in. This is the, uh, this sermon once again is called shining through. It's part one of apparently a multi-part series that he's going to do. This particular one, once again, was uploaded September 20th and currently has just shy of 20,000 views. So let's get going. One of the um, objectionable, um, irrational, easy to criticize things about our faith um, as Christians is, is this. You've experienced this. We actually turn to God when bad things happen, believing he could have kept them from happening in the first place. Isn't this true? Don't we all do this? In fact, we encourage other people to do this. We actually turn to God when something bad happens and we turn to God with this crazy confidence that, well, God, you could have kept this from happening in the first place, but now that it's happened, I'm gonna to turn to the very one who could have kept this from happening. But at the same time, most of us feel like we really don't have any choice but to do that. I mean, where else are we gonna turn? Or, or maybe you've been here before. Um, you find yourself asking God to comfort someone else in the aftermath of a loss, a loss that you are confident God could have prevented in the first place, but didn't. So are we crazy? Um, are we naive? I mean, some would argue, yes, in fact, for you, this dynamic may be the reason you finally gave up on faith altogether. And I'll just tell you, just between the two of us, I understand that. Um, in August, uh, this past August, I participated uh, via video in a memorial service for two teenage boys. Um, they were brothers who passed away on the same day in circumstances, that, in circumstances that are so horrific that I'm not gonna tell you their story, primarily because it's not my story to tell. But if I were to tell you their story, you may not be able to pay attention to anything else I say in the next few minutes. Um, weeks, I did not know this family, weeks after the incident, weeks. Um, all right, so two things to note, I think, right off the bat. One, he is opening with uh, a question or a kind of a statement, assume, you know, this idea to kind of draw you in, which, again, is a speaking tactic uh, in regards to drawing people's attention. So he, Andy seems to be using uh, the preaching methodology of saying, hey, we're going to pop this big question out in front of you uh, or this big statement because this isn't really a question, but a statement. And then we're going to work through that, uh, uh, you know, as far as biblically and see, okay, well, is this statement true? How do we process this statement through the Christian worldview? Uh, and he does that to kind of draw you in. Now, again, I've stated on previous videos, uh, I think my preferred method is opening with scripture and then going into it. But this isn't an uncommon method. Um, it's, it's a method that's used by a lot of people of, as far as saying, hey, we're going to pop this out in front of you to grab your attention so that now you are kind of hooked in. You, you want to know the answer to it. And now we're going to look at the scripture to give that answer to the statement. Also, he 
I'm a little torn about what he just said here as far as, hey, this story is so horrific that if I told you, you wouldn't even focus on the sermon. You'd just be talking about the story. That's why I'm not going to tell you. Um, I, I don't know if anybody else, when you hear that sort of thing, you're like, actually, now I want to know more. So as far as speaking, you could have left that out. Um, but it's one of those things that he at least acknowledges, and this is where the, the communication part comes in. He acknowledges that. Um, it was a smart idea for him not to include that because then the focus would shift to something else. So in that regard, what you're about to see is he, he's withholding part of the story in order to draw you in further to understand the statement he just made. But he's not going to go into a full story mode because that part of the story isn't one, like he said, his to tell. But two, it would be distracting to what we're about to talk about. So I can appreciate that because... I think as speakers and pastors and anyone that preaches or speaks in front of anyone, um, you have to acknowledge like, okay, what, how much of this can I say that, as we've talked about in previous sermon review videos, how much of this can I say that adds to what we're about to talk about rather than, uh, you know, takes the focus off what we're about to talk about, which is, it's a balance. Like it's really hard to, to know where that line is to where you say, okay, that's as much as we need to talk about it so we can move on to the important subject rather than telling you the whole thing. So anyway, this is kind of the methodology he's using um, to get into it. Let's go. Um, which took place in March. Um, the parents actually, uh, the husband sent me an email, a long email and told me the entire story in detail of what happened. Um, there was a statement in his email where he said, it doesn't really matter what God does now because of what he did not do then. The story was so difficult to even begin to imagine that I didn't even want to respond to the email. And I've since told the family that um, when I called, I found myself in a conversation with a mom fighting, fighting to maintain her sanity and her faith. In fact, the entire family was, her husband and their two daughters. Um, and I was not sure their faith would survive. I even said that to her. Um, I tried not to say anything patronizing. Um, they already knew all the Bible verses and all the Bible stories. And in a later conversation, she actually said to me, she said, Andy, the most helpful thing you said, and when she said that, I thought, I can't imagine that I said anything helpful. But she said, the most helpful thing that you said was that, um, that if our faith did not survive this, that that was understandable. You said that it may take years for our faith to recover, assuming that it recovers at all. And that is what I said, and I meant it. And through the weeks that ensued, um, we texted several times. And then in June, remember this event happened in March, in June, she texted me to say, hey, we're planning a memorial service for our sons at a church, one of our partner churches. Um, it'll be in August, and we would love for you to send a short video um, that could be part of the service. And honestly, I was stunned, not that they asked me to send a video. I was stunned that their faith had begun to recover, that they were rediscovering faith but not their old version of faith. They would be quick to tell you if they ever tell their story. A much better faith, a deeper faith, a faith that wasn't propped up by everything is up and to the right. Um, a faith that wasn't propped up by, well, God will make sure that you get back to normal eventually because they will never get back to normal eventually. And what they recovered was faith in God, not the promises of God, not the blessings of God, just God. Because all Okay, so I think we need to stop real quick. So he, he's presented this question, and again, we're looking at how this is outlined and you know things to look for. So he started with a question you know, uh, that's behind him there. We can turn to God when bad things happen, believing he could have kept them from happening in the first place. And then he takes that, and I think this is something that's really lost. I know I struggle with it as well. Taking that statement and then making it like real. So there's lots of times where pastors will tell stories, but they're not incredibly relatable to people. Um, but, you know, we, it, it, it kind of builds into the script, the, the text that they're looking at, or maybe their overall point. So uh, just we, we kind of go with it. This is, again, I've not heard Andy Stanley a lot, Andy Stanley a lot, but this opening uh, is, is a really good example that I think lots of speakers, pastors can learn from in the sense that even if you maybe don't agree with him theologically, maybe you don't, uh, you know, agree with a lot of what he says. Um, this is a really good thing to look at that. He's, he's making a statement. That's what he opens with to draw you in. And then he makes that statement real. So it's, Hey, yeah, we all know the statement behind him. Like we all acknowledge that statement, but where does that really hit home? And then he moves into a story, uh, in which he says, look, you know, it comes down to faith. So he takes this big statement, this really long thing, and then breaks it down to one word in which he's now going to use to segue into scripture. So he says, you know, we can turn to God when bad things happen, believing he could have kept them from happening in the first place. But how can we do that? Faith. And he makes that, that real. He uses a, a story that he actually, you know, experienced in order to bring uh, point A to point C via way of point B, which is the story. 
and he makes it real for us that we go, oh, okay. Like it's, it's almost unnoticeable the, how fast it happens, but this is what he's doing. And I think it's a really good, um, uh, so in the past I've criticized how pastors use stories in sermons. Cause I think lots of times it's frivolous. It's not helpful. It actually detracts from what they're about to talk about. But I do have to give Ainley Stanley props here that he does this very, very well. Uh, in, in the sense of um, not letting it detract from what he's saying, but actually using it as a momentum to build into the scripture he's going to use. All the other stuff, all the other fluff had been torn away in a day. Now, you may know someone like that, and perhaps you're hoping for a recovery like that. And it may help to know, it certainly helps me to know, it may help to know that the men and the women who brought us the message of Jesus walked through similar valleys, valleys filled with random acts of violence, unnecessary suffering and unanswered prayer. And yet somehow, some way they believed and they persevered. Now, last time we were together and I hope you were with us last time we were together. Last time we were together, we looked at an episode from the life of the early church where food was about to become scarce throughout the entire Roman empire. And most people in ancient times were already hungry most of the time. So when a famine struck, people didn't just eat less. In many parts of the world, there was literally nothing to eat. And as we discovered the church in Antioch, instead of turning inward and focusing on their own needs, they actually stopped to consider who would be most negatively impacted by the famine. And then they asked the question, what can we do about it? And in an unprecedented move, in an unprecedented move, they began collecting funds for a group of people they had never met in a part of the world most of them would never visit, whose culture was nothing like theirs. In fact, this is so important and it was so unprecedented. I wanna give you a visual to help you understand the magnitude of their decision and what they did. Um, here's a map of what we generally consider the Holy Land with Galilee in the North, Samaria, Judea, and the city of Jerusalem in the South. Now, these Gentile Jesus followers were located in Antioch Antioch, which doesn't even show up on the map. It is 300 miles away from Jerusalem. And in terms of ancient travel, these two cities, take a look, these two cities were, they were an eternity apart. And culturally speaking, as I said, they were half. So this is again, so he's moved it. I want you to just, again, the purpose of these videos is for educational, uh, you know, to, to learn from how these pastor speakers do things as well as kind of train our brain of things to look for when we're listening to sermons to determine if, you know, this is being used well, if this is being used poorly. Um, so, I mean, we have to uh, look for those things in sermons because they're going to be there, uh, the red flags or the good things. So we need to train our brain to, to identify these. So just to go back to the beginning, so he's used this big statement that's still behind him to build through a story to the central idea of what he's talking about today, which is going to be essentially faith. And then he goes into this contextual understanding of the, the people in Jesus's day being also able to connect to this idea of faith. Not only is he doing that, he, he gives us a really um, brief but detailed overview of what uh, those people are experiencing. I mean, bringing in like a map. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this is like the modern day version of the flannel graph, but he, he's bringing in this idea so we can visually see what's happening. We can understand uh, the, the cultural context, which we talk about a ton uh, on the Instagram page, as well as uh, try to work into these sermon review videos. The idea here is that um, this is vitally important for us to understand uh, the text that we read within scripture, regardless of where the text is found, we have to understand the cultural context of what's going on. And Andy, Andy has now moved us from this, this big statement, this, this question almost, into what he's talking about, into connecting it to uh, our great ancestors of faith, uh, the early church. So let's keep going half a world apart as well. Never before, never before in recorded history had a local multicultural group felt responsibility for a group of people with whom they had virtually nothing in common. Now, here's the question. Where did, where did this politically and socially incorrect behavior come from? Well, it came from their recognition that for God so loved the entire world that he gave. And so they gave. They gave because that's what love required of them. So picking up where we left off last week, the folks in Antioch, the Gentile believers in Antioch are beginning to take up a collection. They're concerned about the believers in Jerusalem who are already suffering because they're being persecuted for their faith. And then there's a famine that's about to make things even worse. So anyway, back in Jerusalem, something terrible happens. I mean, something terrible is coming, but something terrible happens. Um, something random, something um, seemingly unnecessary, something dark, something that would leave Jesus followers scratching their heads and wondering where in the world was God? Here's what happened. The text says that it was about this time, and again, just to put this into perspective, this is about 15 years after the resurrection. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church intending to torture them. Now, this King Herod is actually the grandson, this is Herod Agrippa, um, who's the grandson of Herod the Great who murdered the babies in Bethlehem after the birth of Jesus. So violence clearly ran in their family. And the sum, the sum that he intended to arrest were actually Jesus' original apostles. And his first victim was a high profile target. In fact, his first victim was one of Jesus' first apostles. Here's what Luke tells us. He said he had James, the brother of 
brother of John, not James, the brother of Jesus. He had James, the brother of John put to death with a sword. He had James, the brother of John beheaded. Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Now, this was a huge blow to morale for the Jesus followers in Jerusalem, but it won Herod political points with his constituency. In fact, here's what the text says. When he saw, when he saw. Okay, so I want you to, uh, <laughs> so this may be boring for some of you. So here's the thing though, this is vitally important. So I know in past sermon review videos, like this just gets me giddy. It just honestly does. Uh, in past sermon review videos, one of the biggest critiques of a lot of the, uh, a lot of just sermons that you'll listen to in general is that it doesn't include what Andy's doing right here. Now, again, I'm no Andy Stanley fan. This is like the third sermon I've ever heard of Andy Stanley, but I can tell you he's doing an amazing job in sense of bringing the context out of scripture into a, a place where we can understand what is in the heads and the lives of the disciples during the, the scripture that he, he's going to get to. So, I mean, this is just one big build up uh, of intensity to, so we understand by the time we get to what he's about to talk about, we are fully informed about what's been going on, what's in their heads, how they understand it, the cultural that they're living in, like all of this. He includes, you know, it was, uh, you know, it was 15 years uh, from the time of the crucifixion. This are, these are the people that these words are referring to. Like he's doing all of the exegetical work for you, but not only that, He's highlighting these words so that visually you can say, okay, this is what he's talking about. Okay, this is what he's talking about. Okay, this is what he's referring to now. So that to keep you engaged in uh, and following along. I mean, essentially what he's doing inadvertently, I mean, he, he's essentially training the people that he's talking to to look for these things and to ask these questions. So when it says them, who's them referring to? Like, who, like who is that? So he's almost... Uh, uh, teaching you how to look for those things yourself so that when you're not watching a sermon and you're reading your Bible and you're in your Bible time and your scripture reading time, like those are the questions that you are asking. Um, none of this is I to Jesus. He hasn't brought us into this text at all. This is all about what has happened in that context when this scripture was written, which is uh, amazing. Let's keep going. He saw that this met with approval among the Judeans. Herod proceeded to seize Peter, also, now Peter is a really big fish. In fact, next to Jesus, this is the biggest fish. And this would keep the taxpayers happy and perhaps it would quell some of the anti-Roman sentiment that was usually very high during Passover season. So Herod followed through with his threat. After arresting him, after arresting Peter, so he arrests him, he puts him in prison, handed him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. So Peter is being guarded by four soldiers at all times. And this happened at the beginning of Passover and Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after Passover. Luke continues. He says, so Peter, Peter was kept in prison, but here it is but the church was earnestly praying to God for Peter. They were praying specifically for Peter's release. And there it is. This is one of the many places where the experience of first generation believers intersects with ours. Think about it. The Jesus followers in Jerusalem, think about it. The Jesus followers in Jerusalem are asking God to deliver Peter days after God did not deliver James. Again, the Jesus followers, they're asking God, they're praying, they're asking God to deliver Peter from prison just days after God did not deliver James. I mean, why bother? Um, if God was concerned about Peter, he wouldn't have allowed Peter to be arrested in the first place, right? So if God didn't stop Peter from being arrested, why turn to God after he's arrested? And if God didn't protect James, why should they expect him to protect Peter? I mean, they were as crazy as we are. Actually, we are as crazy as they were <laughs> because apart from their crazy, we would not be having this conversation. Apart from their crazy. So Andy does what I consider something that should be done. He is connecting the biblical text that we just read to uh, contemporary believers right now showing that, Hey, this thing that they did is something that we still struggle with, that we still do ourselves. And this is where faith intersects. So whereas eisegesis reads us into the text and it makes it the text about us, uh, exegesis actually shows that the, that there, there's a, there's a narrative, there's this context, there's a story there that we can learn from, but oftentimes does intersect with our belief system as well. So that we don't read ourselves into the text. We just read it and say, this also applies to us as believers as it did to them as believers. And this is a, what Andy's doing here. He's built it up. So he's had this statement. He's brought it into an understandable form for us as modern day listeners, broke the big statement down to a little statement, then gave us context about what's happened within the early church, then connected that to scripture and then says, hey, that faith that we're talking about is the same thing that they were doing and they were struggling with. And then actually brings up a pretty difficult question that not only would have been for them, but for us as well. Like they're asking for something for Peter that they probably asked for for James and did not get. 
So like, how does that work out? So he's actually fleshing out some pretty, um, pretty deep questions here within the, the realm of faith, which he's already brought up. The message of Jesus would have never survived the first century. In fact, it turns out they weren't crazy and their faith was not misplaced and neither is yours. So for me, narratives like this one are comforting on two levels. First, the people closest to the action, think about this, the people closest to the action, the men and women who actually knew Jesus personally and chose to follow him because of the resurrection, they were not immune to random inexplicable tragedy and loss. And in spite of believing that God could have kept these bad things from happening, they turned to him for comfort and help anyway, right after they happened. So we may be crazy, but we are in good company. We are not the first. And they didn't continue trusting and turning to God because it all made sense. They continued trusting in and turning to God because the thing that made the least sense of all, the crucifixion of God's Messiah resulted in the greatest possible good for all, the salvation of the world, forgiveness of sin, and on-ramp to a relationship with God. And here's the thing, to the degree, to the degree that our faith is anchored to those same ancient events, our confidence in God will sustain us through the random, inexplicable, God, where are you valleys of life. So when you find... Okay, so he's brought it now, he's brought it up uh, to this point, talks about salvation, talks about sin, talks about the cross, uh, and anchors that to not only the thing that he talked about before, which was uh, faith and how we interact with faith, but also what brought them, the early Christians, the disciples, their faith and what it was anchored to and showing that it's in the exact same thing, the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now, oftentimes, I can't tell you how many sermons I have watched or sermon reviews that we have done that you can go back and watch where that that right there isn't brought up very clearly. Like it may be mentioned in passing, but it's not brought up uh, basically, I mean, step by step there, like he just talked about. And here's the thing. He didn't spend a ton of time on it, but he brought it up because there's going to be people that are listening that don't understand how all of this church stuff, all of this Bible stuff, all of this, you know, reading scripture, how does that connect? What does it connect to? Why do we do it? And that's why right there. Find yourself praying to the very God who did not come through for you to begin with the way you wanted him to, the way you expected him to, the way he came through for the person next to you. You are in good company. Peter, Andrew, James, John, Mary, Martha, the men and women whose faith laid the groundwork for the evangelization of the entire world. Their irrational, in spite of, where are you God faith is why the message of Jesus made its way into the 21st century. In fact, spoiler alert, Herod doesn't execute Peter, but we'll get back to that in just a minute. Now, um, several years after Peter was arrested in Jerusalem, he actually sits down and he dictates a letter to Christians living in a variety of regions scattered around the Roman empire. Um, Christians who like himself and his friends in Jerusalem were suffering because of their faith. Now, before I read you what he writes, keep in mind, by the time he's writing this letter, he's been arrested multiple times. Um, he's been living as a fugitive for years. In fact, um, he kept his whereabouts so concealed, nobody even knows for sure where Peter was between his arrest in Jerusalem and his execution in Rome, maybe nine or 10 or years later. Um, yet in spite of this, in spite of this, in spite of the fact that he's living on the run, Here's what he says. He writes to Christians who are experiencing some of the same things he is. He says, praise. Okay, so he's about to get to a set, another text here. Well, let's just start and we'll stop again. <laughs> praise be. All right, so he, he's, he's referencing now 1 Peter, which again, here, I can't tell you how happy it makes me that not only has he given us context about what happened with an ax that he read, but then he gives us a brief summary context of 1 Peter so that we understand that it's been a long time in between what's happened to him very briefly in between Acts and 1 Peter here and what that looks like so that we understand what he's about to say um, isn't just a day, a week, or you know, a year later. Like There's time that has passed, multiple life events for Peter have happened, and that's what he's talking into. Because that helps us understand, and I hope you understand as we've looked at exegetical work and what it looks like when it's done well, such as this, or what it looks like when it's done poorly, like in other things that we've looked at, that that matters a lot. So that we understand that the Bible didn't just happen all like all the New Testament wasn't squeezed into two or years or five years like there. It's a vast timeline that happens. And it's important to understand that contextually so that we see what he's doing here, which is taking uh, he's looking cross examining the Bible, letting the Bible interpret the Bible, showing that there these books and these epistles, they intersect and they actually build on one another because uh, what we're about to read in First Peter actually comes from much of what Peter experienced, what we, re what we just read about in Acts. So let's let Andy get into it. Be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's like, wait, 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 Peter, Peter. You've been arrested multiple times. You've been flogged. You are scarred for life. And the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ did nothing to stop it. I mean, you have a price on your head. Stephen is dead. James is dead. The apostles are all scattered. What are you talking about? And he would say, 
Here's what I'm talking about. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth, a different kind of relationship with God. He has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. In other words, your prayers may not all get answered and you may never understand the randomness of life, but you have hope. And your hope isn't anchored to theology, it's not anchored to belief, and it's not anchored to a book. Peter says that our hope is anchored to an event, an event that rekindled his hope, the resurrection of Jesus. And then he says this, in all of this, all of this suffering, in all of this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief of all kinds of trials, in all kinds of trials. In other words, he says, in light of all that God has done for you, you can find joy and you can rejoice in the middle of it. There's not joy because of the trials, there's joy in spite of the trials because of what God has done for you. And Peter, again, who has suffered in ways we can't even begin to imagine, says that this suffering is just for a little while. And he could have added, on, in all kinds of trials, like I have. To which we say, so wait, again, Peter, grief, trials, suffering, randomness are not evidence that God's not listening that God's not involved. They don't indicate that things are spinning out of control, that we need a revival, um, that Jesus is returning soon, or maybe we've done something wrong. And Peter would say, no, not at all. These, these trials have come. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire, may result, in other words, there's gonna be a result, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Again, to which we would say, so Peter, we should, we should expect this, to which Peter would say, Yes, and people are watching. People who are suffering. So I want you to see, and I, I mean, if you have time, go back. There was a uh, sermon review, uh, Rich Wilkerson Jr. sermon review, in which he covers uh, a, a good portion of the text that Andy just read here. But they they approach it differently in what in how the application is, and I think that's vitally important to see. I'm not saying that one is better than the other. I'm just saying that. Uh, the way a pastor approaches scripture is is shown in how they present it and the application they give it. Uh, Andy here has given us background. He has given us context. He has given us uh, an idea of what Peter, where his mind is at, uh, what he's been through when he writes this and who he's writing it to and the authority that he has in that, that he has hope in Christ, that he can say these things because he's actually been through these things and that he understands that, uh, as, Andy just said, as Andy just said, that Christians can expect these things, that it's going to happen, like it will happen. Um, but their hope is anchored in Christ, which again, uh, I want you to see that before he was talking about uh, the death of Jesus on the cross for our sins, and now he's brought us to a text that talks about the resurrection of Christ and everything being hinged on that resurrection. I don't know if you caught it. I wanted to stop it, but I wanted to make sure we got through everything he said there. But he, he made a point to say that our, our uh, hope isn't hinged on like belief or a book, uh, but it's on the event. And I know he gets a lot of criticism for this, at least from what I've read online. And I can see where the criticism is coming from. But I think what he's pointing to here is that our faith isn't in the Bible. It's in uh, the the person that the Bible talks about. Our belief isn't in a theology like a system. So Car uh, Calvinism, Arminianism, those theology, those, those systems, our belief is actually in Jesus and his life death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. That's where our belief hinges on. It doesn't hinge on, uh, you know, a theology that is built from that. It actually hinges on that event, that person, the personal work of Jesus Christ. Everything else builds off of that, but our faith isn't hinged on that. So if our Bibles are taken away, that would be devastating, but it's not that our faith is hinged on the Bible. Our faith is hinged on the person that scriptures talk about, which is Jesus. Um, so I think that's what he's pointing to, but he was careful to, to say that though, kind of go through it quickly, but just, I, I don't know if you caught that or not. If not, you can go back and, and listen to him say that, but that was, he made that point, And I think he made it specific, uh, specifically within this context to say that our hope and our faith is built on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As you suffer or watching, people suffering without hope will be drawn to your hope, your peace. In fact, they may be drawn to the object of your faith because the darker it gets, the brighter your hope, the brighter your response shines. And then he would say, perhaps, as Jesus said, so as you suffer and as you try to explain the inexplicable, as you navigate yourself and navigate your way through things you never anticipated and for which there are no answers, let your light shine in such a way, in such a way that people see your response and they look up. Then he continues. He says, though you have not seen him, and I love this because remember, he's writing to people who had never actually seen Jesus the way that Peter had seen Jesus. He said, though you've never met him, though you've never seen him, 
You love him based on my testimony about him. You love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and you are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy because you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So once again, we push back. So Peter, so what you're saying is this, that the inconsistency and the randomness of life, it doesn't throw you off. It, it doesn't undermine your confidence. I mean, come on, they got James, they came for you. And Peter would say, no, my faith, my faith doesn't depend on consistency or certainty or my ability to explain things. My faith is not shaken by the randomness of life. Come on, I saw the best possible person suffer the worst possible death. It made no sense at all, none. And God brought him back to life. So while there's a lot I can't explain, there's a lot I don't understand. I just got to tell you, after the resurrection, the rest is just detail. And then in the same letter, Peter gives his audience and gives us the strangest to-do list. But we're going to talk about that. So here's the thing. So I want you to see what he did. Now, I would, I would, this is one thing that I personally would disagree with methodology wise, though I don't see it as a red flag because it's not like he's adding things to the scripture here. But he, he basically read the scripture and then he kind of modernizes it in the Andy version, right? So it's the Andy translation of the text there, which isn't horrible. It's not bad. It does kind of uh, break off the track of what he had been doing, which is walking us, you know, through scripture word by word, verse by verse. Um, he still kind of does that. It's just that there's so much richness there that I think he could have drawn out of that. But again, he's, he's walking us through a modern version. His translation of that text isn't horrible. Um, again, I think that's more of a, it's a methodology thing. It's not a red flag for me because I don't, I don't think he got it wrong. I just think, uh, all those words that he highlighted, as I said before, I think he, he's inadvertently teaching his people to kind of look for those things so that they can exegete the text themselves. They can study the Bible uh, more deeply on their, in their own personal time. Um, but anyway, that, that's just something that pops out. Again, it's not a huge thing, um, but it is one thing that kind of pops up that goes, okay, well, you, you kind of went off what you had been doing there for a minute. But again, not horrible, but it is something that kind of you notice, right? That he goes, actually what he's saying is, and then um, he goes into his last point, which is after that is details. Next time. Now, I want to get back to the storyline real quick. So to catch us up. So um, God allows Herod to execute James. Um, he allows Herod to arrest Peter and put him in jail. Uh, the Jesus followers in Jerusalem are praying and asking God to facilitate Peter's release, knowing that Herod may be coming for them next. And then for reasons <laughs> that made absolutely no sense to them at the time, but would become clearer later. The night before, check this out. The night before Herod was to bring Peter to trial and then have him executed, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance. And then suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell and the angel struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said. And the chains fell off of Peter's wrist. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. And so of course, Peter followed him out of the prison. But he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision or maybe having a dream. And then they passed the first and the second guards and they came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself and they went through it. And then when they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Now, I know what you're thinking because I think the same thing. Really? Really? And why doesn't God do that kind of thing anymore? And why doesn't God do that kind of thing for me anymore? But let me tell you what Peter and his friends were wondering. Why didn't God do that for James, our friend? And they never got a good answer to their question. And we may never get satisfying answers to ours either. So what I do appreciate what he's doing here is that, and this is a good thing for pastors to do and pastors to keep in mind as we're writing sermons, is that there are going to be certain things that we see in the text that we want to, that, that need to be brought out, which are good and valuable things to be exegeted from the text. There are also questions that are going to come up in the, our listeners' minds that we need to kind of anticipate and then address which is exactly what Andy's doing here. Andy has anticipated the fact that there may be people that say, well, if he did that for, for Peter, why doesn't he do that for us? Why does he do that for James? Like there are unanswered questions. And he, he, he just goes, they never knew the answer. We may never do the answer. Now that might not be satisfactory to some people, but he does at least address it and say, look, we don't get the answer in scripture here. We just get the fact that this is something God chose to do. Um, so I got to give him, I mean, this is a great thing because he's anticipating the question and then addressing it as best as he can. 
Peter. Now, when Peter realized that he, this was not a dream, that he really was safe and outside the city walls, he went to the home of Mary, uh, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying for his release. So Peter runs down the street. He knows he doesn't have much time. Um, he certainly doesn't want to incriminate his friends. So he runs to the door of a, a home he'd been to many times. And Peter knocked on the outer entrance and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. And when she recognized Peter's voice, because he had been in their home many times, she was so overjoyed, she ran back to the people who were praying without opening the door and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. Now, remember, they're praying for his release, but apparently they did not really expect God to answer their prayer. In fact, listen to their response. And this is important. This is, this is just more evidence that the writers of the New Testament did not write the main characters in as heroes or even people with more than average faith. They didn't. Okay, so here, I gotta say, not knowing a whole lot about Andy Stanley, I have to appreciate the way he's, he's approaching the text here. He is undeniably teaching the listeners that are, are his, his, his congregation. He's teaching them how to... Uh, kind of study the Bible, the things to look for, the wordage within the text to draw them uh, into asking the questions that the text uh, is assuming will be asked, uh, which is here that, you know, they, they, they are going to be just as shocked as we are uh, of what just happened, which draws out the fact that they were praying. And like you just said, they obviously they were earnestly praying but the response they expected is not the response they got. Didn't experience miracles every day and they did not expect a miracle this day. Now, when Rhoda tells the prayers that Peter is at the door, here's what they said. They said, Rhoda, you are out of your mind. <laughs> to which we'd say, wait, weren't you just praying for this? To which they would say, yeah, but we didn't really expect anything to happen. When she kept insisting, when she kept insisting that it was so, they said, well, then it must be his angel. Uh, it must be his spirit counterpart. He must already be dead and it's, it's his ghost. But Peter, but Peter kept on knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Imagine that, an actual answer to prayer. Imagine that. Now at this point, they are so delighted, they're celebrating and they're making so much noise in the middle of the night that Peter motions to them with his hand to be quiet. And then he says this, tell James, James, the brother of Jesus, tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this. Let them know that I've been, I've been released, that I'm free. He said, and then he left for another place. Now this is so interesting and we're gonna come back to this next time. Luke doesn't say where Peter went. Now, remember when he wrote this, Peter was still alive and was still a wanted man. If Luke knew where Peter was, he didn't document it, lest his doc Again, let me just point this out as a flag, not a red one, but a good one, um, that that is a small detail that is not necessary um, to be kind of drawn out for the sake of the sermon that he's preaching, which is on faith and where our hope lies and what that looks like. But he draws it out because it's in the text and... My best assumption, again, I don't know Andy Stanley, third time I've watched him, but my best assumption here is he wants his people to recognize these things in the text so that they ask these questions as well, so that they understand that there's a context here, there's a culture here, there's something that needs to be, you know, there's statements that are purposely left out. Why did Luke not say? Well, he gave us context. Peter's still a wanted man by the time this is written. Luke probably knows where he wants, but he's hiding, uh, but Peter's hiding out. Like, these are all really important things that make the Bible, all that more rich, all that more real uh, to us uh, in, in, because of the context and understanding the nature of what's happening in these circumstances. And this is, this is a great thing that he's doing here because he's, again, this doesn't necessarily uh, build into like faith and everything about faith, but this is something that his people need to know about, right? Need to look for when we're reading the Bible. Um, so this is a great, a great additive document fall into the wrong hands. So Peter went underground. In fact, he went underground so successfully that to this day, no one has discovered for certain where he went. And then Luke gives us even more detail. As you might imagine, in the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. And after Herod had a thorough search made for him and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. Now, Herod is publicly humiliated because he had promised the people that they were gonna see the trial of Peter, Jesus' number one follower. He's so humiliated, he leaves town. Uh, he goes to his beach house down by the Mediterranean Sea. And while he's there, a group from a neighboring city asked to have an audience with him uh, to show their support because they depended on Herod um, and his favor for their food supply. And Luke tells us about this. Here's what he says. He says, on the appointed day when Herod was having this public meeting, he was wearing his royal robes and he sat on his throne and he delivered a public address to the people. Now, uh, Jewish historian Josephus says that Herod's robe on this particular day was actually made of silver. And that when the afternoon sun reflected off of the silver robe that the- Okay, so you see he's using extra, uh, extra biblical 
uh, writing. So he, he cites Josephus, which is a well-known Jewish historian at the time, in order to make this uh, text, it brings it into an understanding that, hey, look, this isn't just some story made up. This isn't just some account that Luke wanted to write because Luke felt like writing it. Like He's showing that there are, there are documents outside of the Bible that support what the Bible says. So what Luke wrote about uh, we have outside unchristian verified, like they're verified sources of people that were not believers in Jesus that tell us the same event in some cases in more detail because they were focusing on different details than Luke was focusing on. But again, this isn't necessary to bring in, but this is important to bring in so that we as believers see and have an understanding of, okay, where do, you know, that this is a real and living faith, but we can look at uh, other texts to show that this text is real, it's living, it happened, this is what's going on contextually, and it makes it all that more powerful for us as Jesus followers uh, to understand what's, what's happening and what's going on. Crowd erupted and declared him a God. Luke says it this way. The crowd shouted, this is the voice of a God, not a man. And immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down and he was eaten by worms and died. And again, Josephus confirms this. Here's his version. He says that Herod was seized by a severe pain in his bowels. He was rushed off the stage and several days later, he died. Now, what do you think? What do you think Peter thought when he got the news? I mean, he was probably relieved that Herod was out of the way, but he may have thought, God, if you had just taken him a month earlier, James would still be alive, as well as four unfortunate prison guards. And then Luke wraps up this account with this statement, but... But in other words, in spite of all of this drama, in spite of all this inconsistency, in spite of all of these unanswered questions, but the word of God continued to spread and flourish. In fact, we know that it did because it's why these texts were created and preserved. It's why the name and the message of Jesus would eventually circle the globe. But on a personal level, these events and events like these and the response of our first century brothers and sisters is why, to borrow a phrase from the apostle Paul, it's why we don't grieve. It's why we don't mourn as those who have no hope for we believe that Jesus died and rose again. It's why to borrow from Peter's words, it's why we can cast our cares on him because we know he cares for us. You can know that he cares. Okay, so this is an important thing. If you've watched any of my other sermon reviews, you know that um, a little bit of a pet peeve of mine or a lot of bit of a pet peeve of mine is when pastors use tweetable phrases that they've made up that are rem like they're very rememberable, right? They're, they're something that you remember that they're like, take that down, take a note. And it's something that kind of rolls off the tongue. Again, <laughs> I'm no Andy Stanley fanboy, but he's, he's quickly, I don't know, I'm going to have to watch more Andy Stanley sermons, but he is not using his own words here to communicate something to make us remember. He's pointing back to scripture to, again, clarify in what scripture interprets scripture here and saying, hey, these are the words of the apostles. These are the words uh, of Peter himself that's been through all of this. This is what Peter said that we can take hope and remember. So this isn't tweetable phrases. This isn't like little witty sayings that somebody's made up that rolls off the tongue. This is the words of the apostles. So this is where our, and I think I've said it in a number of different sermon reviews, but this is where, uh, you know, the reason that you, you should bring up scripture or your pastor should bring up scripture when he's preaching, because that's where everything is anchored from. Nobody's going to watch this sermon and think that, oh, well, I'm going to believe this because Andy Stanley said this, or I'm going to, you know, pursue faith in Jesus because Andy Stanley's just, you know, he, he's just really, you know, charismatic and I, it's just, I, I'm drawn to what he's, what he's saying. Andy has consistently through this sermon pointed back to scripture, not only pointed back to scripture, but encouraged through the entire time of us asking the questions of why the words are there and why, you know, what said and why it said that way, um, the entire thing is based and anchored in the Word of God. So um, I, I want to make that notation there that there's going to be times where there's like tweetable phrases, you know, rememberable things that have been said that roll off the tongue, but Andy doesn't use those things. I think he's done it like one time. Um, and he passed, he, he, all of this, he's pointing back to Scripture and anchoring it in Scripture. He cares for you. In spite of what you see around you, in spite of what's happening to you, it's why, to borrow a phrase from the author of Hebrews, we can approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. It's why we have hope, even when we don't have explanations. If Peter is correct, and he would know, if Peter is correct, what strikes us as random, unfair, unnecessary, may in fact be random, it's certainly unfair and perhaps unnecessary, but in spite of that, if Peter is correct, he assures us our hope is not misplaced. Our hope, your hope is not in vain 
because we have a living hope that is anchored not to our ability to predict and interpret circumstances. We have a living hope that is anchored to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And we will pick it up right there next time. Now, in the meantime, I have three questions to help keep this conversation going. And I hope you Okay, so here's an interesting thing here that um, I think a lot of churches we struggle with. Bigger churches like the church that Andy Stanley pastors probably doesn't struggle with this so much because they have to find ways in order to uh, kind of shrink the church. And by that, I mean like small groups, discussion groups. But most churches uh, have a form of this, but this is a really good way that he's doing this in the age that, you know, uh, you know we're, we're all, most of us, not all of us, but a lot of people are viewing sermons through the screen like this. Um, the idea of here keeping this conversation going through the week. So this isn't just like a one moment, a one time, like a woo, yeah, big woo-ha moment where we all get excited. He actually wants this conversation of what he's just talked about to permeate our thinking and our conversation throughout the week so that we come back, we now continue the same conversation. He's going to leave uh, with his people with some questions here to have them kind of mull over with this knowledge that they were just given for this following week. So let's see what those are. Hope you'll begin the conversation right now if possible. Question number one, has your faith ever taken a hit because of random, unnecessary, unexplainable suffering? I think we can all say yes to this question. Number two, why are we so prone? Why are we so prone to tether our faith or our confidence in God to how well things are going? And number three, I want you to read Hebrews chapter four, verses 14 through 16, and then answer this question. What does the author encourage his readers to tether their faith to? Now, Okay, so before we stop, or before we push play and let him kind of end this whole thing. Um, the longer you're alive, right? So I don't know how old you are when you're watching this video, but um, you're going to see that kind of preaching methodology goes through phases. So there's the, there's the newer form of preaching methodology, which is, uh, it, it's the form of a lot of the pastors that we've covered on this, this channel so far, which is very charismatic, very outspoken, very energetic, uh, very geared toward like a younger generation. Um, this Andy Stanley, though, obviously <laughs> I've heard about him a lot. I've never watched a lot of his sermons. I, I, I said before, I think this maybe is the third one, but, um, he, he comes from like the, the school of methodology before that in the sense that um, there's, there's a lot of, this could almost be turned into a Bible study DVD, right? Where you watch it at home and then you go through a book like that. It's very like the academic version almost of, of Bible study. Um, it was when I was in youth group, this is the kind of thing you would see all the time that it would end with questions. Now um, there's goods and bads of that, but I want to focus uh, uh, one uh, what we see here from the questions. Um, he's asking questions to kind of get us to interact with the text we've just looked at and then ends with the third question, which is saying, hey, read this and then answer this question, which is again, here's the thing. It's not asking us to read ourselves into scripture. It's asking us questions based upon what we just read of scripture and about scripture. Um, and then it ends with pushing us into more scripture, which is where he encourages people to read Hebrews 4. Um, and then ask the questions of that. So it's this interactive, hey, we just talked about this. We just dug into this. He inadvertently, I mean, I think it's purposeful, but uh, when we're watching it, it's kind of just below the surface of teaching his people what to look for and the questions to ask, and then leaves them with this so that they you know, have the option to, to continue this and this not just be a Sunday thing, but this actually be a whole week thing. Now, if you don't remember anything else from today's message, I hope you'll remember this. There is hope even when there are no explanations. There is hope even when there are no explanations. The men and women who brought us the gospel, who risked their lives to ensure that the life-changing message of Jesus survived the persecution of the first century would attest to this. When it feels like it and when it doesn't, your hope is not in vain because your hope is not in hope. Your hope is in your risen savior. Okay, so he ends with, again, this is a, is a speaking uh, tactic, but he, he started with that difficult question goes all through scripture and then brings us back to hope. So he started with, you know, how can you have faith in, in, in bad times when, you know, God could have prevented the bad times, brings us into it through a relatable story, breaks that big statement down into one word, which is faith, walks us through the scriptural text about uh, Peter and the early church and faith and what that looks like and the questions they would have had, and then brings us to the end, which is saying, hey, when those things happen, understand that it's not new our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ long before us went through the same thing. And because of their example and because of what we read and because of the hope we find in Jesus' death, resurrection, uh, we can have that same hope and ends with that. It's a well-rounded sermon. 
Uh, lots of good exegetical work there. Like there is no question where that is anchored in. Um, you may have some feedback. I didn't see anything in this sermon where he took anything out of context. In fact, I think this version uh, of looking into scripture is going to be the best one uh, because here's the thing. Uh, when you, and this is why I would encourage, you know, th this type of preaching, uh, it's going to make it incredibly difficult to interject your opinions, thoughts, anything into the process because you're bringing out the context and culture and history of what happened and showing that through the, the truth of Jesus Christ. So it makes it nearly, I'm sure people could do it, but it makes it nearly impossible to interject one's own opinion in this uh, because it doesn't leave room for that. Like it's, it's just exegetical work and then brought into an application of, hey, this happened to them. This is what it looked like. And this is how it applies to us as modern day believers. This sermon here, again, going to have to watch some more Andy Stanley because I don't know, that was good. I'm sure there's things that I disagree with him on theologically. I know there's interviews I've seen that I'm like, I don't know about that statement. But this this sermon here, this this preaching that he just did was solid. Um, so there you go. Uh, I would say that is a great example of what, what to look for in a sermon. Uh, guys, thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for sharing. Uh, it's been really encouraging to get your messages, your DMs about how these sermon reviews have been helpful to you. Um, so thank you for those. It's very encouraging. Keeps, uh, keeps me going because obviously there's a lot of negativity that comes with these as well. So I appreciate those positive messages. Thank you for following on Instagram. Thank you for subscribing to this channel. And we will talk to you later.